specifically not over the question of the relationship between the state and religion or the religious character of the state. It had a constitutional order that reliably incorporated Sharia as the source of law, and it had internalized mechanisms by which the Supreme Constitutional Court regularly passed on Sharia questions, Al-Azhar had a consultative role, etc. and nobody, that was not the grievance that was at play, the grievances that were described in Tahrir Square had nothing to do with religion, etc. Fast forward two years, and is an incredibly deeply divided society, more polarized, I would say, than Turkey, specifically over the question of the religious character of the state, and I think what produced this deep polarization was the process choices that were made between February 13 or 2011 and June 30, uh, 2013 that set in motion a set of debates that got refracted through religion. So at any moment in a society where religion represents a serious cleavage as it does in Turkey, or even in a society where it doesn't but it gets deployed in a way that it comes to signify other deeply felt divisions in that society, there's always a possibility that religion can be used in a way that either alters the constitutional order or imperils the regime and so forth. But those are process choices. And the trouble, I think, that's worth noting is the ways in which some of the at least process preferences of many in Turkey that are outside of the AKP camp themselves have, a, have um, sort of entrenched a tendency in the direction of much greater escalation of polarization that sets in motion a dangerous trajectory that could then become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So what was the self-description of the AKP until very recently? And again, I apologize for reprising conversations I've had with most people already today who happen to also be around this table. But you know, as recently as two years ago, we witnessed this prime minister travel to Egypt and actually propose to Egyptians a secular state and describe its values to them, and of course be repudiated and booed in that Egyptian audience, not only because it appeared to be this kind of imperial appearance in which he's making institutional design prescriptions for the Egyptian populace, but also because he was making what at the time appeared to be a deeply unpopular argument. Of course, now today, at least half of Egyptians claim that they're prepared to go in the streets and die in defense of that very secular state that a year ago they were booing over, but whatever. Erdogan was prepared to stake his personal foreign policy intervention in Egypt on the values of secularism. Now, what did that mean? Obviously, the AKP didn't share with the Turkish Constitutional Court the court's privileged interpretation of constitutional secularism, but they made a series of arguments that could be detected in their political party platforms, in their constitutional amendment proposals, in those public statements that they made both at home and abroad, in their notion of the much vaunted Turkish model. In a whole host of arenas from 2002 to about 2012, you could read their claims that they would embrace various things, you know, passive secularism, which came to be a kind of trendy way of thinking about different ways of um, imagining a deeply entrenched sort of metaphysical commitment to secularity as opposed to secularism as an institutional device that just allowed the, the state to remain neutral with respect to religions. That was popularized by uh, California, actually another Turkish uh, studies political scientist, Ahmed Kuru, who wrote a book that basically described the world of Turkey, France, and the United States constitutional secular principles in terms of assertive versus passive secularism. But they were basically claiming to embrace a kind of form of secularism as constitutional principle that meant equidistance from religious groups and neutrality of the state, allowing religious expression in the private sector, the flourishing of various forms of private sphere, religious activity, and so forth, so long as it didn't impinge on the state, and primarily understanding secularism as a mechanism for protecting the autonomy of the religious sphere from the state. This was the notion of a secularism they were prepared to vindicate. Now, depending on the direction that both polarization, institutional confrontation, and intervention take in Turkey, you can easily imagine an abandonment, and indeed you can detect one, at least in the statements publicly made by the current prime minister, of that notion of tolerant secularism in favor of some kind of you know, privileged access that he now claims to what amounts to an authentically Turkish set of values inflected by religion. That's a quite different set of claims, and he's beginning to shift personally, whether the party is following him or there's a broader swath that follows this view, he's beginning to shift towards a competing set of metaphysical commitments. So just as he accused his prior you know, political adversaries of having a, a metaphysical commitment to a concept of secularism itself as a foundational value to, be, to trump religion altogether and exclude it and displace it, he himself seems to now be committing to a metaphysical conception of authentic cultural value in Turkey inflected by religion, which displaces or at least threatens the secular character of the state by having the state get into the business of promoting religious values in one way or another. The question of how deep that runs, how far it goes, how to measure it as compared to the earlier record, and what happens if you take it seriously? What happens if you say this has become an Islamist actor 
who's trying to capture the state for religious purposes, so we must organize against this religious actor and religious capture of the state, what kind of trajectory you then set in motion when you choose to read and characterize the AKP in that way is another set of questions that I think we have recent regional experience with and, and I think would be very dangerous. So I think there's a, there should be an invested interest on the part of the AKP's own adversaries to read in a different light the moves that they're engaging in now. So for example, I made light of the alcohol regulations last summer. They were often characterized in the Western press here as like, basically you're no longer gonna be able to consume alcohol in Turkey or Turkey is embracing it's Sharia light, this kind of thing. And so I would go on talk shows and say, Connecticut has Sharia hard, if that's Sharia light, because you know we have, you, the closure laws are so much more extensive in many American states than the closure law that was introduced here. Now that's one way of looking at it, right? What is the actual institutional effect of the rule that's proposed? But another way that's equally valid, but has different implications, is to say, let's look at the framing under which this was proposed. We were told that the prime minister is entitled to intervene in our private lives and how we construct them. We were told that prior legislation had been written by a couple of drunks. We had disparaging language about basic alcohol dependency of the entire uh, opposed camp, et cetera. And, and the whole thing was proposed in a light that suggested something much more insidious than what the actual rules accomplished. Now, part of that is, Erdogan doesn't know how to take yes for an answer. And so he basically systematically overplays his hand in ways that have, could have deeply troubling implications. The, the question is, to what extent do you set a self-fulfilling prophecy in motion when you take seriously the rhetorical framing that he provides and engage with that instead of looking at the relatively modest actual institutional effect of the, the policy change itself and limiting yourself in a way that then doesn't, because the other element, and this answer has gone on too long, is he's, he understands very well that he has, for the, at least in the recent period, been the beneficiary of polarization in Turkey. So the more he uses inflammatory rhetoric and polarizing strategies to package what are otherwise, you know, maybe I would choose that particular policy but have moderate effects, and then the opposition seizes on the framing and not the effect and entrenches that polarization, he creates a rather rather flag effect in his own constituency. And if you share the assessment that that constituency may represent a durable majority, now you're going to have to go to extra democratic means to contain it. Mm -hmm. if, if you play into the polarization the sort of dynamic that he himself is deliberately setting in motion. But I think alternatives exist, and those alternatives disrupt that trajectory and would be better process choices for those who both want to defend democratic values and, and, and for that matter, liberal commitments in Turkey, and want to avoid having this current climate of polarization lead to an even more serious institutional conflict. In answering that question, uh, you mentioned uh, the rhetoric versus pragmatic effects. You mentioned intra-party, the possibility of intra-party um, dissent or, or differences. And you mentioned Erdogan's presentation of himself to the international community as a specific kind of model. And I wonder whether any of those things or all of those things or something else um, helps to explain what you said about the um, current situation. Which is that up to this moment, up to including Twitter, um, for some reason or other, the government has listened to the court, this fragile or what a fragile barrier or fragile membrane, whatever you call it. What explains that so far that's working? Well, I mean, it's an optimistic reading. I mean, it is working at the Turkish Constitutional Court level. They've actually chosen to ignore a series of orders at lower courts. Absolutely. I mean, having said that again, we often see that here as well. Stays are pursued, orders are not implemented until an appeal is fully heard through. But nonetheless, I mean, it's, it's troubling that's not the appropriate procedural approach that the branch of the government should be taking. Um, I mean, it's actually a kind of an interesting moment and an interesting question about those three elements from my earlier answer that you seized upon. So it's clear that the AKP was once very committed to vaunting a Turkish model of a kind, and they have also equally clearly abandoned that project at this point, with some limited exceptions. I mean, they certainly have an interventionist policy in Syria, they have a number of other ambitions in the region of the Middle East, but their desire to please international markets or, or subscribe to a particular kind of international image has definitely been backburnered in comparison to the dramatic domestic crisis that they face and the need to rally their own base. And so now I think most of Erdogan's calculations can only be understood in domestic terms. And indeed, he's liberally engaging in anti-American and, and anti-Semitic and all kinds of other um, conspiracy theories in addition to his assault on the Gidan movement. 
to explain his current predicament. So he's no longer particularly motivated by Turkish model style arguments. Having said that, there are some basic, I think, constraints that at the moment he believes he still operates under. And one of them is some of the core um, elementary institutional requirements of NATO participation, of continued EU customs union, of basic things where if you were if you were to step in and say, not through these constitutional amendments, I will enhance the Ministry of Justice's role in dealing with investigations and appointments, but rather I defy the Turkish Constitutional Court and I will not implement its orders. That's a different level of constitutional crisis, and in both in overtness and in degree of confrontation institutionally and in the sort of impasse that would be produced by that move. And I think he isn't desperate enough for domestic crisis reasons, and I mean, it would be a level of overreach institutionally that he might lose amongst his own constituents, but also, more importantly, amongst sitting members of his own party. So he hasn't yet needed to go there. That doesn't mean he won't need to go there. I mean, he is facing a very, I mean, notwithstanding the most recent municipal electoral performance, which again, I think, is evidence not of his particular electoral popularity necessarily, but of this durable electoral majority phenomenon. The way you undo that durable electoral majority for the AKP is by producing a split within what passes for the center right in Turkey. That the AKP has successfully consolidated. So the AKP represents business interests, it represents religiously conservative groups, it represents some nationalist groups, it represents groups that have heretofore been represented in a multiplicity of parties in the 1990s and now are all under one big tent. The Gulen movement was part of that tent. And this fracture represents at least an initial split. It was a very small part of that tent. People will measure, I, think, I mean, again, Statistics about the Gulen movement are hard to come by. Good statistics about the Gulen movement are harder to come by. But the measure of the electoral potency of the movement is like two to five percent. It's very small. And indeed, we witnessed these most recent municipal elections. You didn't see a lot of people boycotting the polls or not showing up, which one might think is really bad. But it does portend the possibility that you could imagine a competitor emerging in the center right that could capture at least some portion of that base. That would produce a moment of competitive politics that would represent a set of significant alternatives for a base that's very unlikely to vote for the CHP or the BDP, possibly might vote for the MHP, but again, unlikely for a variety of other reasons. So is left continuing to vote for a party, while it may very well, though, be repudiating aspects of the actions of the party at the head of that party. So what I guess we should see in the next period is the degree to which we might see some more daylight, either between other senior members of the party and the prime minister, or between the actions of blocks of parliamentarians of the prime minister, or disaffection at the polls when the polling is about the prime minister himself, as opposed to the sort of broader preferences, policy preferences of the underlying population. So anyway, I mean, to you know, I don't think he's very interested in a model anymore. I do think that he is not yet in a state of desperation that requires him to defy the constitutional court, but it's not beyond the pale of imagination. And I think that what's promising about this moment is the first really fully open fracturing from within his coalition, even if it's at the margins to the Gidan movement. And also, I mean, as a, just as a secondary factor, the fact that the Gidan movement itself is forced to be accountable in some way, is forced to sort of rise up out of the shadows and have itself exposed to some degree of scrutiny and some level of sunshine is probably in and of itself another actual net benefit of this particular moment, notwithstanding the depth of the parent crisis that we're in.